mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years...
us pray. Gracious and holy God, thank you for people that care, that reach out and love on us whenever we don't feel good or when stuff's not going perfect in our life. God, we want to lift up everyone that is traveling, not just right now, but will be traveling to take care of their places as it gets cold. And Lord, we, we do tend to pray and give thanks to those sunny days and those warm days. And it's sometimes really hard to give you praise and to lift you up when it's freezing outside. But here we are sitting in this space, worshiping you, doing just that. Got our hearts and got our minds in this time that we have gathered together. And Lord, we, we also want to lift up those that are suffering from accidents that have happened recently, specifically in Fort Worth, the horrible accident uh, where 133 cars and six people lost their lives. God, we lift up their families. May you give them comfort and strength and warmth. Because God, you are more than enough. Even when we don't think that it's possible, but you are. Savior say, my strength in me.
Jesus paid it all.
That's an interesting sound. <laughs> oh, my bad, I'm standing on the board. <laughs> You know, every time I do a funeral or a memorial service, I become aware of uh, what various things. Actually, the sermon title on this one should be the double portion, probably, but that's okay. It reminds me of something, though, that I wanted to say when I came up here. Y'all don't ever see Holly. She's just sitting over there hiding. But it is so incredible to have somebody that gets here early and works through the, the, the PowerPoint and works with Chris and the worship team. And we're grateful for that, aren't we, Chris? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and, and so you see her getting better at it. The, the letters and stuff are bigger and the contrast is better. And she's doing a great job. And so I just, uh, let's recognize Holly over there. You know, one of the things that, that I have become aware of is that I'm not standing here today all on my own. Uh, so I do these funerals or memorial services. We do more of those now almost than funerals. And I've always become aware when I get to meet the families, sometimes I know the deceased person and sometimes I don't. But I get to meet the families and, and so they start describing the person that died. And the traits they're talking about are exhibited most of the time in the people telling the story. Because we don't get to where we are all by ourselves. And so we, we make this journey, right? And, and we get to a place, as, you know, I, my mom and dad didn't, weren't recovering alcoholics and didn't need to be. But the, some of the things that I learned from them did two things. Some of them led me to be there and some of them also led me away from there. And so you have to learn the difference. And in, in, in uh, the recovery groups, we say the serenity prayer, you know, and it says, I learned to accept the things I can, to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And, and so I think sometimes when we read the scriptures, we need to think about these things didn't happen in a vacuum. The reason that in the Old Testament, over and over and over, it says God is reminding the people there's only one God is because they didn't get it and they kept worshiping other gods. And he had to keep telling them over and over. We need to keep hearing it too sometimes because we find other ways to worship other gods. And, and so I'm going to read in a minute the scripture, which I did one day this week in my devotional too, and I used it today, some of it today in the memorial service because I think it's important to realize that we get an inheritance and that inheritance isn't always about money or property. It's about our persona, who we are, and our spiritual body, as JT read in our, in our service earlier today. You know, it says, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if you have a physical body, then surely you also have a spiritual body. And, and so yeah, I began to think about that some time ago and realized that, uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes I look in the mirror and see my dad, you know, uh, Sometimes I look in the mirror and, and see my mom in some ways, you know, some of the traits and things that I do. And I hope over time that I learn how to pick the better ones and leave the other ones aside because none of us are perfect. We all have warts and wrinkles and, and we don't do it perfectly. I, we don't raise our kids perfectly. We don't do everything perfectly. We don't do it. And we, 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 we want to be better than we are, don't we? I mean, that's, that's sort of our goal. We'd like to be better than we are right now, no matter who we are or where we are. And we look around sometimes at these other people and say, but they are further along than me. I want to be like them. So I'm going to pick this up. It's in, it's in 2 Kings, and it's uh, the second chapter, and it's the story of Elijah, uh, the prophet. And you'll remember that when Jesus was in existence later on in the New Testament, people didn't know who he was. The disciples weren't sure. People didn't know. Even when he was being crucified, they said, is that Elijah? Because Elijah is like one of the most significant prophets in all of the Bible. And so he had a disciple. His disciple was Elisha. You have to be careful. It's Elijah and Elisha. And so that's where this story is. It says, now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha 
were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on the ground, on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. Elijah said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am taken away from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Now we're going to leave it right there. It's a mystery as to what happens next until we read the next verses. But I'm reminded in, when I read this story of, you know, as, as a little kid, uh, especially a little boy, I guess. I don't know about girls because I didn't have any brothers any sisters, but, uh, you know, Dad, we had a lawnmower that had, it was a real type mower. It had a motor. And uh, my dad would get out and he'd mow the grass. And I couldn't wait until I was able to do it too. I wanted to do the things my dad did. Well, until I had to do them. That's right. Then I didn't want to do anymore. <laughs> And, and, and there were other things like that, the way he could fix things and the way he could do stuff, driving a car. I, you know, I wanted to do the things my dad did. I really never enjoyed driving with him in the passenger seat because uh, I didn't do it quite like he did. But, but, and he, came, he grew up at a time when brakes didn't work as well and so forth. He thought I trusted way too much in the brakes and other things like that. But, but that's just me and my dad. But there's other people like that as well. Bosses that I've had, people that I've worked with, people that I've hung out with, people whose spiritual life is in a place that I just wish I could be. You know, some of those people, they just, they just seem to be okay no matter what happens. You know, God seems to find a way for them to get through the, the trials and the storms of life, and they just chug right along. And I've been fortunate as a pastor, I have been able to be with people as they take their last breath, the, the people that know that they've reached the end of the journey. And so many of them are all a lot like Elijah. They're not dreading it. They, they look forward to what's next because it's not about where you were or what, where you are. It's what's going to happen. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up here and get something I want to read to you. As we talked about earlier, I don't know who to attribute this to, so I'm going to attribute it to the person that, I, that gave it to me today. She uh, said this about her dad. She said, this is not goodbye. This is our new hello. The hello I feel when the wind brushes my cheek on a cool, windy day. The one I will hear when a song plays that reminds me of you. The one that surrounds me when I'm feeling sad and alone. Yes, it's the new hello that I will find comfort with and know that you're always nearby. The hello that I will be greeted with when I hear my wind chimes chime. It will never be a goodbye, Dad. 
It will just be our new hello. I think it's powerful, ever what she wrote. And I think that so many times we look at life as if it's this journey, and, and we're looking at, at, you know, it's like driving from here to Dallas. You think, man, when I've hit the Dallas city limits, I'm there. Well, that's not the way life works. We get to a place where there's more to see. When you go north from here, like going to Colorado, you drive up on something called the Cap Rock. It's around Amarillo. And, and from Wichita Falls, or really from Fort Worth, until you get to Amarillo, you're going up the whole time. You don't realize it. It looks like a long, straight, boring road. But you're, you're climbing up. And as you look in the rearview mirror, you can see, wow, I'm seeing so much further behind me than I can in front because I've climbed and I'm not even aware of it. I think that's where Elijah was in this story. I don't think he knew what it meant to be Elijah at all. And I think that's why Elijah cautioned him about it. He said, that's a tough thing you ask for. It's a tough thing if you want to inherit a double portion of what I have. But he gave him some instructions and said, if you do this, if you hang in there till the end, if you're with me all the way through, then you'll get it. But you have to be there all the way through. You see, that's the kind of commitment that Jesus calls us to have. That's the kind of commitment that we get when we go to the rooms of recovery programs. You know, people look at me sometimes and they say, wow, you, you've got almost 32 years of sobriety. I say, well, yeah, but I did it one day at a time. If you'd asked me uh, 32, well, 30 years ago, are you ever going to have 31 sober? I thought, no. And that's the only reason I've been able to do it. Because if you start to forecast that far in the future, you're going to fail. This is, I, I grew up with this kind of simple theology that said, if I, just, if I just live my life good, if I'm good to other people, I'll go to heaven. But if you take that theology, you're going to miss life in the midst of that. There's so much going on around us right now. There's so much need in this world for the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. I had the privilege this morning to uh, go to a restaurant not far from here and, uh, and eat breakfast. And, and, and I want to tell you, the joy and the the exuberance and the chatter among the people in there was joyful, absolutely joyful. It was uplifting. Now, I know I have a personal inside deal here that somebody in the room wasn't having a great day. But you know what? There was so much joy and happiness all around, and part of it was because of the person who wasn't having a great day. Because what we do, friends, is we keep going even when the going gets tough. And we keep doing sometimes when all we can do is just do. We're not really that much into to the faith that we're going to make it through, but we just know if you keep taking one step at a time, moving along one little bit at a time. One of the guys, when I used to be in the farm equipment business, somebody would come in with their stuff broken. He'd say, man, it just keeps, I just keep falling down. And old John would look at him and say, if you're falling on your nose, you're falling forward. You're making headway. You're moving. And to me, this Elijah, Elisha story is so important because it reminds us that there is stuff to receive from those that precede us. Those that built this building back in 1957. I mean, who'd have thought that they would need this size of a building? And I, I don't know. You know, we don't sometimes need that big of a building today. You know, who'd have thought there needed to be a, a church here? In fact, people began to wonder that in about 19. 2008 or so, they began to wonder, why do we have a church there? There's about 18 people here. On a Sunday morning, with the biggest service we had, there were less people than we have right now. And they didn't have any future. They didn't have any hope. They, we needed to, we really needed to do it sooner to take the stained glass out so people could see outside, to see that there's something about Christ that needs to get outside of these walls. It needs to go further. It's not just about what happens in here. This place is like an airport terminal. Did you know nobody, or almost nobody, there probably is somebody that does it, that goes to an airport terminal for their vacation. But they go there to get to their vacation. And contrary to some people's popular belief, you don't go here just to meet Jesus. You go here to get enthused and, and empowered, if you will, to go and do Jesus' work in the community. The same thing is true in, in 
the meetings I've been to, whether they were uh, different kinds of recovery groups, it, the group itself isn't the deal. It, it's accepting the power that our higher power God gives us to go out and share the message. No matter how new you are at it, there's somebody that's less new than you or more new than you. There's always somebody that is less further along that needs to know that wants to find out who this God is, what Jesus is about. Where do you get this peace that Jesus says I give to you? Well, I can tell you where you get it is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, how do you get that relationship? How do you get any relationship? You start talking to people. You get to know them. You hang out with them a little bit. You know, it's amazing. Uh, I, even with masks on, if you have enough personality to reach beyond the mask, you'll be amazed at how many people can recognize you and see you and tell that you're smiling behind that darn thing. But we use it as a barricade to say, I'm hiding back here and you don't have to know who I am. But I want to tell you, people have been wearing that mask for years, way before the government told us we ought to put one on to stay safe. You know what I'm talking about? When somebody says, how are you? You think, they don't really want to know. And so we answer with fine. I'm fine. I could give you an acronym for that, but I can't do it in here. <laughs> it's a facade. It's a mask. We've been wearing those masks for years. And it's one of the reasons that I think the church has been in decline is because the people outside see the mask. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody would say to you, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been told this, I've invited people to church and they said, well, you know, the roof would fall in or, or you know, nobody wants me there. Well, why do you think they say that? The same reason that God says only one God because they've been pushed away, they've had a bad experience, they haven't found it worthwhile, and they haven't met Jesus there in the way that we want them to. Now, some of that is up to everybody in the building. In other words, if, if people walk in here and they're new and nobody talks to them, well, then guess what? They leave and they say, well, that's not a very friendly place. But I can tell you, almost everybody that ever walks their way into the doorway of a church is looking for something. I remember a time many, many years ago now when it was Easter Sunday, you know, Easter's a big day at the church. We have a lot of people. There was a guy, he was in his 80s, and he was standing all alone. People were walking right past him, paying absolutely no attention. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, hi, my name's Jack. Are you okay? And he said, he kind of lit up. He said, well, I'm so glad that you noticed that I was here. I said, yeah, well, you're, you're here, and we'd love to see you again. And who are you? And tell me about yourself. He said, well, my wife has Alzheimer's and she's in a nursing home and she's not going to live much longer. I'm all alone. And I need a friend. And I said, well, you can have some here. And he kind of looked skeptical. And so a friend of mine came walking by. He was actually our church custodian at the time. And he came walking by. And he was also single and also lost a wife. Had also been through some of that. He was a little bit younger. And I just snagged him and I said, hey, let me introduce you to this guy. His, his initials were JT. It's not this one. I said, let me introduce you to this guy. He's looking for a friend. And so that, oddly enough, that friendship cemented. And those two sat together in church. Those two were in Sunday school together. They did stuff together. They, they didn't go golfing or fishing or anything. They just, but this, this person named JT knew that this other guy was going to be there when he showed up. Over time, his wife did die, and we had a service. And not too many years later, he had a heart procedure that he didn't recover from. And there were four or five, I don't remember now how many of us, that all got together and went down to the medical. This is back when you could visit people in the hospital. And we all got together and went to the hospital and got all around his bed and prayed because he had, he, and we just wanted him to know, you're not here by yourself. Now, he had children, and they were responsive, and they were around, but... You know, those kind of are automatic friendships, right? To, to know that these other people that he'd only known for a short time were willing to take time out of their day and go down there and circle up around his hospital bed and give him hope that this was going to be okay. Well, it turned out not to be okay. And not too many days ago, one of the sons called me. 
And he said, we just found out where your church is. And when this COVID thing is here, we want to come back. And I said, well, you're welcome to come here or go to any church. But I think you need to go to a place where you can find friends. Because I believe that the body of Christ works through the body of Christ. Just like the strength that I got out of the recovery groups was from a group of people that had similar problems to me, that were willing to admit they weren't perfect, that were willing to admit they had issues. I think when we at the church can be transparent. So a long time ago when I came to this church, they hadn't had anybody talk openly about things like alcohol addiction or drug addiction, and especially from this place in the church. And it wasn't just a short time until some of the people began to tell me the stories about sons or daughters they had that were in prison or because it was, it was like freeing them up to be able to take the mask off and be who they were. And I think that's, that's a challenge. It is, it's easier to put the mask on, don't you think, Mike? It's easier not to get involved with people because you know what happens? If you get a friend, you have to be a friend. And when you start to have these relationships, the kind of relationships that I experienced in recovery meetings where if your car didn't start, somebody stayed there until it did. I always worry about when we have people that come here that don't are connected and, and they need to be connected. You know, we almost need to have a buddy system, but I'm kind of anti-organized buddy systems. I think they just ought to organically happen. And so we as Christians, if we believe what we say we believe, ought to be willing to be the heart and hands and feet of Jesus all the time. Here at the church, even at Walmart, if you're walking along and you see somebody that looks alone and sad, I guess I'm gullible or I look like I have information. I can't tell you how many times I've been at Kroger and some person will stop me and say, do you know if this is a good kind of rice or do you know if this is a good kind of anything? We need to be the kind of people that are open to not only that, but not, we don't want to look at them and say, well, look, I don't work here. You know, if you have experience, share it. If you don't have experience, tell them that too. Maybe sometimes we just say, I don't know, but let's look and see which one looks good. I wonder if living life like that wouldn't give us all a little bit more joy and a little less worry about whether they were in agreement with us about everything. And Look, whatever number of people there are here, I guarantee you I don't agree with all of you about anything. I agree with some of you about some things. But that doesn't mean I don't care about you and don't love you and don't want to help you along that journey so that we all work together to do the kingdom work that God calls us to do. So in my life, if I look back at it, this is what I would encourage you to do today is who are the Elijahs for you? The people you want what they have. And if you haven't told them you want it, you see, that's the, that's the thing. Elijah was willing to walk to places do stuff, hang in there because he wanted it. He, he wasn't just going to take a simple, oh, just stay here. You realize if he'd have stayed in the first place, he wouldn't be in the story. And he became one of the most important prophets next to Elijah that we have because he persevered. He pushed through. He wanted what his mentor had. I think I'm going to end with that question for you. Is who's Elijah for you? In, in some groups, we call that a sponsor or a mentor. Who's that person for you? And do you realize that you may be that person for someone else? Are you willing to respond to them, give them some advice if necessary? Be their friend, no matter what. I think it's worth thinking about the double portion. That means whatever he was, you want twice as much. And I agree with Elijah totally. You're asking a very tough thing. Amen? Amen? Well, friends, we gather tonight to worship and praise God and celebrate the Lord's Supper. So JT's going to come and assist, and we're going to do that. Uh, if you've, I think everybody here has been here before, but we're in, in COVID protocols right now, so we, uh, we're using little cups full of grape juice little tiny pieces of bread. In the Methodist Church, we have what we call open communion. In other words, everyone in the room is invited to come. And so we would invite you to come in a few minutes.
And as JT lifts up some prayers, call us here. Lift up your heart. Uh oh. I think it's working. Nope. Is, is JT on now? Not good now? Oh, there we go. Okay. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And the church says, Amen. 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 So as you come forward tonight, you know, our offering here is done in a basket in the back. And if you have gifts and offerings and tithes, we'd glad to accept them there. We have a plate up here, which is our uh, nickel, dime, and quarter ministry that we do for our missionary in Brazil. Her name is Emily Everett. So if you have some spare change, um, that would be a great thing. Friends, the table is prepared. Come to this place where heaven and earth meet.
you got a preview. Tomorrow I'm preaching about the mountaintop. <laughs> if you want to know what that's about, be here at 11. We'll, we'll uh, gladly show you. You know, we get a chance to gather like this every week, and sometimes we don't realize how blessed we are to be able to do that. So many places around the world and in other, even parts of this country, it's just not possible to, to have the, the atmosphere that we have here. And so let's be thankful for the blessing we have, for those Elijahs in our life, and the ways in which we're Elijah for someone else, and then the ways that we can be Elisha as we move forward over the years and the days. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for our chance to gather together. We thank you for the fellowship and the friendship that exists in this community. We ask you to guide us, guide our steps and lead us as we go from this place. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, go in peace. Amen. Thanks, Mike. I'll be doing that. Watch your step. Oh, watch your step. When you see that, yeah. see that guitar stand over there? Yeah. 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 I forgot your water. <laughs> 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 <la